Hello everyone and Namaskar. So today's podcast is a continuation of the reading of the book titled Anandamurti the Jamal Puriyars. And this is a reading of the 15th chapter titled Demonstration Year. The seed of omniscience lies inherent in the human mind itself, but due to utter ignorance, the human mind has forgotten its inherent nature and capacity. Despite the growth of Ananda Marga, Baba's private life continued to be as simple as ever. As Dilip Bose, an Acharya who was related to Baba by marriage, noted, Baba was one person with his disciples and a completely different person in his family life. He was so completely normal in his family life and other social situations that no one would think he was anything other than an ordinary man. At home, Baba lived the life of a dutiful son and a good neighbor in a lower middle class family that could not afford undue luxuries. The room he shared with his brother Sundanshu had a wooden bed, a small bench that doubled as a table, a small bookshelf, and a few hangers for their clothes, nothing more. He wore his shoes until a hole appeared in the sole, and then he would take them to a cobbler to get them resold, rather than buy new ones. Instead of throwing away his soap bar, when it became too small to grasp, he would paste it to the new soap. Unlike traditional Indian gurus, he would not accept gifts from his disciples, neither food, nor clothes, nor even flowers. In fact, he permitted himself no unnecessary extravagance, following his own teaching that true wealth is mental and spiritual, and that attachment to physical possessions, more often than not, proves harmful to the elevation of the human spirit. Baba's efforts to keep his identity as the Guru of Ananda Marga a secret were so successful that for a long time, most of his neighbors, and even his family members, were not sure exactly what his connection to Ananda Marga was. Many assumed that he was a member of the new organization. Some knew that he was a president. Lakshmi, Baba's next-door neighbor, suspected the truth, but he was too polite to ask Baba directly. Instead, he pestered his old schoolmate, Rameshwar Baita, about the matter. Having seen Rameshwar, on occasion, accompany Baba to the field, whenever he asked him if Prabhat Da was the propounder of Ananda Marga, Rameshwar would either change the subject or be as evasive as possible with his answer. One day, while Rameshwar was walking with Baba in the field, they stopped at a natural spring. While Baba was squatting down to drink, Rameshwar asked him if it were proper for a disciple to evade the truth by subterfuge. Baba looked up at him. No, of course not. Why are you asking me this? Baba, My conscience is bothering me, although every day Lakshmi asks me if you are the Guru of Ananda Marga, and I always have to do my best to evade a direct answer. Rameshwar, this is not a selfish action on your part. You are doing it for my sake. I have a lot of work to do. I have to go to the office, to the ashram, to the market. If everyone comes to know that I am the Guru, it will create problems for me. Not only for me, but for my neighbors, my colleagues, and my relatives as well. It is a matter of courtesy. As late as 1963, a man from Jamalpur came to Anandanagar to admit his son into the Anandamarga Primary School. When he arrived, he told the disciples that he was an acquaintance of Pravadda. He is a very good devotee of Anandamarga, he told them. He attends every Anandamarga meeting. He is a very knowledgeable person also. He cannot be defeated in debate. The disciple smiled and nodded, but did not mention to him that his Pravat Da was actually the guru of Ananda Marga. Since the inception of his work as a spiritual teacher, Baba had been conducting demonstrations for the benefit of his disciples, practical illustrations of the spiritual teachings, and fascinating looks at aspects of incarnate life that were normally beyond the purview 
of human perception. In 1956, such spiritual demonstrations became a regular occurrence, prompting some of the senior disciples to speculate that Baba was using them to accelerate the growth of the organization and deepen the understanding and commitment of the many newcomers. Although the nature of the demonstrations varied greatly, many of them were variations on common themes. Demonstrations of samadhi were frequent, along with looks at the various symptoms associated with the awakening of the Kundalini. There were numerous demonstrations showing the subtle mechanisms underlying the functioning of the universe, many of them centuries away from being discovered by modern science. The death demonstration will be repeated on a number of occasions over the coming years, but perhaps no demonstrations were more popular than those that showed the process of reincarnation and the effect of our past actions on our present lives. In the beginning, different disciples served as Baba's subject for these demonstrations, but as time went on, Dasarath gradually became his principal medium. The quiet high school headmaster, whom everyone respected for his honesty, simplicity, and rapidly developing aura of saintliness. The first time he met Baba, Baba told him that he would be a sadhu on the inside and a gentleman on the outside. He soon became a dedicated spiritual practitioner who rose each morning at 3.30 to sit for three hours of meditation before beginning the day's activities, a practice he would maintain for the rest of his life. Yet, much the same as his master, he would play the roles of family man and educator to perfection, always keeping his life as a yogi a private matter. Baba would usually touch Dasarath on the back of his head at the level of the medulla oblongata and ask him to look into the mind of a nearby disciple and describe what he saw. As Dasara's own practice progressed, however, Baba dispensed with touching him and simply asked him to concentrate his mind and look. Suddenly, upon Baba's command, the fog in his mind would clear and he would start seeing images appear as if he were inside a cinema hall watching a motion picture. Then he would describe what he saw, well aware that he was only a medium. As time passed, Dasarath began to develop the ability to see the mental plates of others, even in Baba's absence, an ability he would not find as agreeable as one might think. In one interview, Dasarath described his experience. At times, Baba used to select me to see spiritual vibrations. On one such occasion, I was shown the different kinds of waves radiated by the persons present in Baba's room at the Jamalpur Jagrati. These waves were radiating from the heads of the persons there. The waves were of different colors. One of these persons, an intellectual, had greenish waves around his head. Baba told us that greenish waves represent intellect. On another occasion, I saw a person with a curious kind of wave. I had never seen such a phenomenon. Black waves were coming from the right side of his head and face, and white ones from the left side. I was stupefied and could not speak for quite some time. Baba understood my perplexity and said, Yes, the man is very good within, but his exterior is rough. The white waves show his inner sentient nature, and the black ones his superficial states. On yet another occasion, I saw the waves of a young boy before his personal contact with Baba, and then again after it. Before meeting Baba, the waves were quite black. After the personal contact, the blackness of the waves was greatly reduced, and they were mixed with streaks of white. Then I developed a habit of seeing others' waves. It gave me much pleasure. And so, even without his permission, I continued my curious vision. One time, I noticed white waves around the heads of two persons standing on the veranda of the Jamalpur Jagrati. I happened to meet one of them later when he had almost left the Marga. The waves around him had become dark and distressing. 
I told Baba that I was seeing people's waves, even without his orders. Baba asked me not to do so, as it was a path fraught with the possibility of downfall. I have since given up this kind of thing. Dasarath recounted in another interview that it was as if he were seeing people's auras and thoughts with his open eyes in the same way that he saw their clothes, except in this case, he was using his inner eye and there was no way to close it. He discovered that it was all too often a disagreeable experience. Too many people had dark colors swirling in their auras, a reflection of their negative states of mind and unsavory character. And hearing their thoughts was sometimes like listening to a madman speak. Finally, Dasarath went to Baba and complained, and Baba mercifully withdrew the ability. As the demonstrations increased in frequency, Dasarath gradually acquired such a reputation that newcomers will sometimes be afraid of him, worried that he might be able to see their private thoughts. His notoriety grew to the point that once in the early 60s, a college student named Amit came to Jamalpur to see Dasarath after having heard that he can see people's past and future. It was only after he went on his first field walk that he realized that Dasarath was only a medium and that the real power resided in Baba. Among the demonstrations that were often repeated were ones in which Baba showed that the revolutionary hero Subhas Chandra Bose was still alive, despite official reports of his death. In one such demonstration, Dasarath was seated in the ashram with the other margis for Sunday darshan. Concentrate your mind, Baba told him, and start moving toward the eastern horizon. Describe what you see. Baba, I see a succession of forested hills and open plains. Baba continued to guide him as if he were an air traffic controller, asking him to change directions several times. Under Baba's guidance, Dasarath started east and then turned in a more northerly direction until he reached the Himalayas. Describing the scenery as he went, Baba led him through the foothills to the higher ranges of the Tibetan Plateau. Stop there, Baba told him. Where are you now? A remote mountain, Baba, near Limpopo in Tibet. Now descend and look for a cave in the mountainside. I can see a cave set into the mountainside below an outcropping. Enter the cave and describe what you see. It is quite dark inside. I can see the figure of a yogi sitting on an animal skin, performing meditation. His upper body is naked, he has long hair, and there are some cooking utensils nearby. Do you recognize the yogi? No, Baba. Look closer and see if you can recognize him. Dasarath hesitated for a few moments. Baba, it looks like Subhas Chandra Bose. Yes, that is correct. Ask him if he would like to come back to India. Dasarath remained silent for some moments before answering, perfectly motionless in lotus posture with his eyes firmly shut, as was the yogi in the cave that he was witnessing with his inner vision. No, Baba, he has no wish to come back to India. His only wish now is to dedicate his life to spiritual practices. Leave him in peace then. He has done enough service for the society. Now he has reached the stage in his life when he should concentrate on sadhana. On another occasion, Baba summoned a dakshini, a type of luminous body, or devayoni, and told Dasarath to ask her if Suvash was still alive, and then look closely at her forehead. If he saw a star, then he was alive. If he saw a cross, then he was dead. He saw a star. Baba would do numerous demonstrations over a period of years, showing Suvash living the life of a yogi hermit. Demonstrations about the mysteries of reincarnation were common. Once a female disciple, who used to visit Jamalpur regularly, lost her young son to a fatal childhood disease. One day in the Jagrati, overcome by her lingering sadness, she requested Baba to tell her 
how her dead son was doing. Baba consoled her for a few minutes and then turned to Dasarath and told him to see if her son had already been reborn. Dasarath concentrated his mind and began narrating that he had taken birth in a well-to-do family of Gowahati in Assam. He was about to say the name of the family when Baba stopped him. It will create too much tension in her mind, Baba said, if she thinks that she can locate her son. Now enter the baby's mind and see whether there is any awareness or anguish over his separation from his previous mother. No, Baba, Dasarath replied. The baby is very happy in its new family. He is receiving a lot of love and affection. Now look into the baby's future. What do you see? Baba, the baby's future is very bright. Good. Now go deep into the baby's mind and see whether or not he would like to go back to his previous mother, where it's somehow possible. Baba, the baby does not want to be disturbed. He is happy where he is and does not want to leave. When the demonstration was finished, the woman discovered that the anguish she had been harboring for so long had dissipated. In fact, she felt relieved to hear that her son had gone a happy birth in which he could continue his spiritual journey. Baba went on to explain the karmic reasons why her son had come to her for such a short time. The samskaras that he had needed to exhaust through the medium of his early death. He concluded by saying, Human relationships with those who are close to us only last for a certain period of time. Family life can be compared to a railway journey. At every station, new passengers board the train and some of the old ones get off. It is natural that we befriend the ones that get on and develop a sense of warmth and affection for them. But do we shed tears when they get down at their respective destinations? No, not at all. The same applies to all family relationships. As long as we are together, we should love each other and honor our duties towards each other. But once the tie is broken, we should not give way to grief and despair. All such relationships are temporary. The only lasting relationship is with Paramapurusha, the Supreme Lord. On another occasion, a young man from a well-to-do family came to Jamalpur for his first darshan. While the Margis were seated with Baba in the Jagrati, Baba asked Dasarath to see the young man's past life. Baba, I see a dense forest. In the middle of the forest, there is a sadhu sitting and performing meditation. Now move ahead a few years, what do you see? I see a dead body covered by a white cloth. Yes, this boy was a spiritual ascetic in his previous life. He was a good sadhaka. But he harbored an attraction toward material enjoyments. At times, he would hope that he could be born into a rich family in his next life. Since he was a spiritual aspirant and regularly repeated God's name, a snake bit him in order to fulfill his latent desire. For this reason, he was born in a merchant's family. Baba turned his attention to the boy. Are you afraid of snakes? Yes, Baba. I've had a terrible fear of snakes ever since I was a child. Even now, I can't divide the thought of them. Do your sadhana sincerely. Gradually that fear will vanish. Demonstrations where Baba showed the past lives of different disciples became so commonplace that many of them became overly curious to know who they had been, although few had the temerity to ask Baba directly. An intellectually minded disciple from Calcutta, Manohar Lal Gupta, used to visit Jamalpur whenever he got the chance. He too became curious about his past lives and soon convinced himself that he must have been a very advanced yogi in his previous life to merit such a powerful guru in this one. On one such occasion, Manohar attended the darshan with a group of friends whom he had recently inspired to take initiation. During the darshan, his mind wandered while Baba was giving his discourse, musing once again about his hidden past. 
He was jolted back to the present by the sound of Baba calling his name. Manohar made his way to the front of the room and sat down next to Dazarath, excited by the thought that Baba might be about to show him his past life. Sure enough, Baba asked Dasarath to peer into his mind and see who he had been in his previous life. Baba, I see a pond outside a small village in what appears to be rural India. A sadhu is approaching the pond and preparing to take bath. He is taking off his shirt and his lungi, leaving only his loincloth. Now he is wading into the water and chanting Rama Rama in praise of the Lord. Manohar felt a sense of anticipation, wondering if Dasarath or Baba would name the saint or tell in what era he lived and how elevated a soul he had been. Baba, Dasarath continued, he is swishing his hands in the water while he remains absorbed in ideation. Yes, what more? I see an old fish approaching the saint. The fish seems to be dying. He is barely able to move. He is just to the side of the sadhu. Dasarath remained quiet for a few moments. Ah, the sadhu's hand touched the fish. Immediately afterward, the fish rolled over and went still, floating up to the surface of the pond. Okay, now tell me who was this boy in his past life? He was that fish, Baba. Yes. Baba drawled in his slow, gravely voice while the blood rushed to Manohar's face. He was a fish in his past life. At the very moment that fish died, its body came in contact with the hand of that saint. Because the saint was absorbed in cosmic ideation, the spiritual vibration emanating from him caused the fish to undergo ulamban, a leap in evolution. Manohar returned to his friends, unable to hide his embarrassment. But after a few years had passed, he would enjoy telling the story and making fun of his earlier arrogance. In one interview, Chandra Shekhar, now a retired engineer, described a similar demonstration during his student days. A feeling came in my mind at that time that I must have been either a great person or a king in my previous life. Due to this, some ego arose in my mind. It was probably the third time I saw Baba. I was sitting near him, and although I had a feeling of surrender, I also had some ego. A clash was going on between my feelings of surrender and that ego, and the ego was not letting my feeling of surrender grow. There was a discussion. Baba's mood became grave. Suddenly he said, He is full of ego. Everyone looked around to see whom Baba was speaking about. He was looking at me. Baba's mood had completely changed. I felt that I had allowed a crude mentality to come into my mind. Baba asked me to stand up in front of everyone, and then he asked Dasarath to see my past lives. Dasarath started to stare at me, and I was also looking at him. Then Dasarath said that he was seeing the flesh in my body without the skin over it. Then he said that the flesh had fallen away, and he was only seeing a skeleton standing there. While he was saying those things, I was also feeling that I was a person without skin, and then without flesh, just a skeleton. These feelings came into my mind, one by one. Dasarath was having some difficulty seeing, so Baba helped him. Then Dasarath said that he saw a large meadow. In the meadow, there was a tree, and under the tree, someone was sitting. Again, he had trouble seeing, and Baba helped him. Then Dasarath said that he can see an eagle flying in the sky. Baba asked him whether or not there was something in the eagle's claws. Dasarath said that the eagle was indeed carrying something in its claws. Then Baba told us that I had been an eagle in my last life in some jungle of Brazil. He began telling us that one survey party had gone there and one engineer had become separated from the survey team. He got lost and became very hungry. He was sitting under a tree counting the last breaths of his life, thinking that he was going to starve to death. It so happened that the eagle was carrying a piece of meat in its claws. As it flew over the tree, it dropped a piece of meat, which landed in front of that man. When he saw the piece of meat, he became overjoyed. 
He immediately thought that the food had appeared through the grace of God. When he looked up, he saw the eagle. So he prayed to God to do something good for that eagle. He was a very pious person. Due to his blessing, that eagle became Chandra Shekhar in this life through Ulamban. Baba mentioned that much. And so all my vanity and ego got powdered down before him. Then Baba told me to proceed further with my sadhana and try to become great. He told me not to think about my last life because such thoughts would make me regress. I should look forward and continue moving further and further toward my goal. Baba often used similar demonstrations to show the intricacies of the law of action and reaction, cause and effect, and how it impacts the long journey of the living being across the lifetimes. In his philosophy, he made it clear that a person's destiny depends on the nature of their thoughts and actions and the resulting samskaras. Continued indulgence in crude thinking can, he pointed out, cause the mind to degenerate to such a point where it is forced to adopt an animal body in the next life in order to satisfy its acquired samskara. Once Baba was walking toward the ashram with Dasarath, as they passed in front of one house, they saw a large crowd gathered together. The atmosphere was grave and solemn. Baba asked Dasarath to go and see what was happening. After making a brief inquiry, Dasarath returned and explained that the head of that family had died a few hours earlier. Family and friends were gathered in mourning as they prepared the body for its final journey to the cremation ground. Baba listened quietly and then resumed walking. Dasarath, he said, look carefully and see if you can trace the future path of progress for this disembodied mind. Dasarath concentrated for a few moments and then said, Baba, this mind has regressed. It will take the body of a dog in its next life. Yes, that is correct. Though this man was a prominent member of the Brahmin community, he was not a pious man as befits a Brahmin. In fact, he was a sinful and greedy man who never reflected on his misdeeds or repented for them. He was full of caste vanity and arrogance. Throughout his life, he treated the lower caste with scorn. What will be his reward for his pride and vanity? He will be reborn as a dog. If he wanders into a gathering of Brahmins, will they not treat him as an untouchable and drive him away, just as he did to others in this life? Though the demonstrations were often humorous and always instructive, there were times when Baba used them to impart a stern and sobering lesson to some wayward aspirant. On one such occasion, a new disciple from Hasaribag, Kamalesh, was participating in his first field walk. As they were walking towards the tiger's grave, Baba turned to Dasarath and asked, Now tell me, what life will this little boy get if he dies at this time? A look of shock appeared on Kamalesh's face. Don't worry, Baba said. I am not saying that you are going to die now. I am only asking Dasarath to see what type of body you would take if you were to die now. Dasarath looked at the boy for a few moments and said, Baba, if he died now, he would take the body of a scorpion. Baba turned to Kamalesh with a grave look on his face. What sort of activities are you involved in that would make you develop the reactive momenta of a scorpion? Tell me. Kamalesh kept silent. When he didn't answer, Baba changed his subject and began conversing with the other disciples who were accompanying him. The next day before General Darshan, Baba asked some disciples to call the boy who had come from Asaribag and bring him to his room. After a few minutes, everyone could hear Kamalesh weeping inside Baba's room. When the door opened, nearly an hour later, and he and Baba came out, Baba asked him, Do you understand why your mentality became like that of a scorpion? Yes, Baba then don't worry about what you have done anymore. Those reactive momenta are finished. Forget your past and look to the future. From this moment forward, live your life like a true human being. Though 1956 would be looked back upon as demonstration year, such demonstrations 
would remain an integral part of Baba's teaching style throughout his lifetime. Though the disciples will sometimes share these stories with non margi relatives and friends, they were aware of how fantastic they sounded. As one disciple remarked, sometimes we wanted to run out in the street and shout to everyone to tell them what was going on inside that room. But of course we couldn't. Nobody would have believed us. Sometimes we had a tough time believing it ourselves, and we were right there watching it happen. Thank you.